work. Uh, I am Karis, in case you didn't know that already. I'm Karis Cobb, an editor at Future Print. Um, joined by, we have over here, Rosie. Hi, Rosie. Rosie Whitelock is managing director of Bonacheer. And we have uh, Amanda Newman, head of marketing at Tharston. Christy Duval, your vice president of sales at The Box Maker, and Holly Steedman. And Holly, I have to check your title, you've got it's a long, long one, title. Yeah, it's a long one. <laughs> Business and Technology Development Director at Integration Technology. There we go. <laughs> um, and yes, this is, this is about women leading in print, but it's, you know, we've had some, some calls uh, ahead of, of today to talk a bit about what, what we might like to cover and a bit about our own experiences. And really, it's about, so much more than that, I think. It's not just women in print. It's about you know diversity and leadership. It's about exactly. attracting people into the industry. It's about you know making sure that we're reshaping and reframing things you know for um, a more balanced future. And someone I, I know Emily will, will give me a wave when it's time to finish because I think we could probably keep going for for a couple of hours if you were given the chance, but we won't. Um, so I think the first thing. It would be good to cover would be female versus male traditional kind of stereotypes, but also you know not stereotypes of, of leadership styles. Um, I hope everyone has read a, a great Futureprint article that, that Marcus wrote um, about is it time for more female leaders? And I think it, that was kind of spurned by um, Jacinda Ardern. Uh, New Zealand Prime Minister's response to, to COVID and some other female leaders there. You know, we talked about our female leaders more compassionate and empathetic and balanced, collaborative um, and inclusive. So, and I think, you know, Rosie, one of the things we talked about when we were having a, a, um, a prep call was, you know, we, we want to talk about the advantages of, of being female leaders. This isn't just, you know, we will cover some of the challenges, of course, but it, it is about, you know, the strengths that we have as, as, as female leaders. Yeah, definitely. I think um, females bring a certain set of skills and males bring another set of skills. And I think you need that 50-50. And at the moment, the print industry is not that. Um, there's a lot more male leadership than there is female. Um, and I think we could really benefit from having more female leaders in the industry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and Amanda, I know we spoke about, um, you were talking about a book that you'd read, I think, that talks about those different types, those different leadership types and how we need, you know, that balance and, and that diversity. Is that, is, that, is that kind of, I haven't read the book, yeah. but kind of what it's about, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it, it's sort of a framework about um, analysing um, personality types. It's called mm -hmm. Five Voices. It's from a management consultancy group called Giant. And it, there's lots of different ways to you know, analyze personality types, isn't there? But that's my favorite. I think it's a really good one. Mm. And the point of it is it's, it's been developed over years of working with management teams. And they've found that the most effective management teams are the ones that have five diff all these five different voices. They have to have each of these five different voices. And um, if you have even one missing, then you're sort of losing out. You're not as an effective management group, board of directors, executive team as you could be. Mm. And just in the, as an example, um, there's, there's so, so there's two different voices, which I'll just give as an example. One of them is much more likely to be a man. One of them is much more likely to be a woman. So the guardian is more likely to be a man. And this mm. is someone who um, analyzes all the risks and you know they're quite um, averse to fiscal risk and, and they, make, they like to make sure that they've got everything covered, all the challenges analyzed before they actually um, give their okay to a project. Yeah. So 70% of guardians are men. Yeah. On the other hand, uh, we've got a nurturer who you might not be surprised to know is more likely to be a woman. So 70% of nurturers are women and they tend to be more um, they sort of think about the human side of things and mm. they think about how will this af affect our workforce, what will the public say, that sort of thing. And, um, and they tend to be more open to instigating change right now for the future good of the company. So both of these things are really important, aren't they? The, the higher up you go, the more important these two personality types mm. are. And everybody's different, everyone has a different sort of you know, personality, but, but as a whole, you can see that if you're got a board of directors that's all female, you might be missing out on a guardian. And if it's all male, you might be missing out on a female. Yeah. So it's just important to have a diverse range of opinions and yeah. um, experiences sat at that table making those strategic decisions for your business. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's about balance, isn't it? It's about exactly. having a different balance of personalities, people from different backgrounds, 
ethnic diversity, you know, gender diversity, um, it is really, really important. And um, I think, you know, from Christy, we heard you, you speak earlier, um, slightly different topic, but still really relevant to, to what we're talking about now. Uh, and I think one of the, the things that was interesting that you talked about um, was that you didn't give up, you know, that, that tenacity, that keep, keep going, keep pushing for what you wanted. Um, I know we've spoken about, you know, again, on our, on our prep call that you all missed out on, but I'm, I'm trying to, you know, recap it for you guys. Um, talked about how some women won't go for, for what they want as much as men will, even if, you know, if, um, if they don't meet all the criteria. Um, do you think... That, that being a woman maybe was the thing that helped you to, to think, I'm not going to give up? Do you think you, you felt more barriers but because of that in your career trajectory? I, I don't know that I... Um, I don't know that at the time I felt that there were barriers in the way. I think that I just saw myself as somebody who um, really wanted to persevere and, and sort of make it, so to speak. Um, you know, I'm not a person who necessarily, um, you know, I, I didn't graduate college and I became a vice president somehow. But I think if I were to look back along the way, I think there were barriers, but mm -hmm. I just decided to plow through. But I think there are a lot of people, um, certainly younger people in an organization who don't have experience, they, they tend to, you know, they tend to hold themselves back. Mm -hmm. And I think as women, sometimes the thought of, well, I'm going to have a family, um, maybe I shouldn't apply for that because I'm going to have to figure out how to balance everything. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that, that kind of takes us on, on to you, Holly. I know we've spoken about uh, perhaps there's advantages and, and disadvantages to, you know, particularly if you being in a technical role uh, as a woman, maybe you could talk a little bit about your experience there. Yeah, I mean, um, so I come from a technical background originally, and I think... Actually, if you look at a lot of uh, the leaders in our, our printing industry, a lot, many of us did come from a technical background. And that kind of loops round to the, the point that there are less women that start off from a technical, in a technical background. You know, when I did my, my studies, um, engineering studies, I, I was the only woman on my course. Um, you know, so I think that can have a disadvantage in, in our industry for, for, the, for the leadership positions because it's often which very strong technical technical based industry. I mean, a lot of people brought that topic up today about how, you know, and you always see it that we're engineers at heart, you know, and the same goes for my company. My, my company I'm working for now is, we're mostly engineers, you know, mm. and, um, you know, at my company, I was in, I just recently started this new position and, you know, they saw that I brought a whole different dynamic to yeah. the to the company. And so they embrace that, you know, but mm. some companies don't necessarily take notice of that or, you know, pick that out as a, as a, as a positive. So, you know, because in my younger days, it was, you know, go back to, to your point, point about being pushy, you know, it is yeah. not necessarily a, nat a natural woman's trait to be, to be pushy. It's, you know, often seen as aggressive. And I remember even being told that I was aggressive when I was a young, as a young woman, you know. It was a very aggressive conversation or very aggressive, you know, um, yeah, because I was asking for feedback for something. Mm. And, yeah, and I was, for me, it didn't phase me, you know. I, I just was like, okay, whatever, yeah. then I'm going to carry on because, you know, if you, if you don't shout, if you don't put your hand up, you know, you don't, don't get anywhere in life, really, to be honest, you yeah. know. And, but there are less women, I think, that see it like that. Or maybe a little bit more restrained or we're more, we're th overthinking about what, you know, what will people think about us because we are more um, emotional <laughs> beings in general. Obviously, we're generalizing. But so we are more concerned about what people's perception of us, I, I believe. So, yeah, I think it's it kind of... Yeah, it loops around to that point, yeah. It does, and I think there's, you know, there's, there's two ways of looking at it. There's also that w women can be viewed more that way. And again, I'm, I'm not trying to generalise. A lot of, of what we're saying here is from, you know, um, academic research or well-sourced articles that I'm happy to share with, with everybody because we've built up a, a kind of a, a Google Doc with a lot of, lot of uh, links on it, so I'd be happy to share that with everybody. But there's, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was... Um, a university study where they 
asked students to say what they thought of this person, and the only difference was that they replaced Heidi with Howard. And you know, when it was Heidi, she was always viewed as, as being more aggressive in her career, um, you know, a bit more pushy, a bit more bossy, just different, thought of differently. So there is that that kind of unconscious bias as yeah, well there's, sometimes. There's, there's decades of social yeah. science research, isn't there, that, yeah. that shows that we, we like people to conform to stereotypes mm. um, and we hold people to those stereotypes and we do see men as, as someone who should be um, strong as being a provider, um, opinionated, yeah. even, uh, you know, they're allowed to be aggressive, but yeah. women, we want them to be, we want them to have more communal qualities. We want them to be sharers and givers and think about the common good and not necessarily about ourselves. And, yeah. and, and men and women hold men and women to those mm. stereotypes. And, and that's why there's, um, if you look at the, the, so I think when you look at the differences between men and women, I think the, the strongest correlation that they can pull out of all the, that, that research is that as men become more successful, they become more likable. And mm. as women become more successful, they become less likable. And, and it's because of these stereotypes. Yeah. So, mm. so, you know, there is a lot of research to back that there up, is, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. The, the nice thing about that, though, is that um, the solution to that is, is just to make people aware of it. Mm. So if you actually tell someone uh, that that is your unconscious reaction, that if a woman is more likely to, if, if a woman is um, opinionated or asked for a pay rise, if you tell someone you are more likely to react badly to that than if it was a man, mm. that they, they react differently next time. So that there is a nice solution to that, and it's about raising awareness and talking about it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's critical to start from a young age. I mean, we're all guilty of it. I mean, I'm guessing many of you have kids there. How many times have you said to your son or daughter, oh, that's a boy thing, or that's a girl thing, and you haven't really actually even thought about it? Mm. You know, it, it yeah. really does start, I think that's, for me, that's the big point, you know, we, it needs to change the mentality and it needs to start from a younger age. You know, it's, I hear it from my son, you know, he says, oh, I don't want to wear that because, to the kindergarten because they, they might think it's girly, you know, or mm. something like that. So this is just, I always say, think about how you're speaking to your kids, you know, because they, they're the ones, the, the only way we're going to change this kind of mentality and is to actually start from, from, yeah. From the children, you know, and, and again, that's something with a lot of research behind it. You know, teachers are, are more likely to call on on you know male children in school, and you know, it, all those kind of things do reinforce that bias. And you know, over time, if you know, if you're a, a girl, you you might think, well, I'll stop putting my hand up, or I, I can't do this because that's more for men, kind of thing. And I've like, just thought I've never ever called my son bossy, but yeah. my daughter, if she's I will call out, I'll say, stop being bossy. Mm. And I think I'll catch myself on that next time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah you, have to th you have to really th yeah. think about it because it just comes, just comes subconsciously yeah, now. Naturally. Yeah, naturally. Mm. Yeah, I think when we're talking about challenges, it kind of brings us on to the issue of, of, of childcare and traditional you know, <coughs> family roles, I think, is an is important thing to cover. Um, even if you don't have kids, I don't have any kids, but it's still, you know, it's if we have more equality in terms of, of childcare and, and a bit more equality of, um, you know, between men and women splitting those responsibilities, that's, that's good for everybody. That's good for all women. It's good for, for everybody. Mm. Um, I think it's a bit, I something you said, Rosie, when we were talking before was interesting about during COVID, you know, your senior leadership team um, are, are mainly women or all women. Mainly, yes. Yeah. So we've got 10 on the senior leadership team. Um, seven of which are women mm. and during COVID every single one of them was at home with their kids their husbands even if they earned less than them they went out to work and my senior leadership team couldn't come to the office and work from home um, and it's just I think that's what we do naturally as mothers no we'll, we'll stay at home and look after the kids we'll be able to work from home and do the cooking and do the cleaning and sort the kids out yeah off you, you, you go off to work I think that's yeah just naturally what we do as women yeah mm. This unpaid work is a big issue. I mean, I, I read this book called Invisible Women, Women which is very yeah. interesting. Men should read it for sure, because it basically yeah. discusses about how the world is, is orientated on men from everything, from development, from cars, from medicine development, to public transport systems, to housing. Everything is really mm. aimed at, at, at the, 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 the male population. And I, in there, there was a good statistic, 75% of unpaid work in in the world is is undertaken by women mm. and that's you know really a, a thinking point yeah 
It is. It's shocking, and it's yeah. It's a it's a really good book, and she has a new podcast series, so I'm plugging her podcast yeah. as well, oh. Visible Women. So listen to that and the Future Print podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think Christy, we talked about that as well, didn't we? That that unpaid labour. I think you were you were saying perhaps you know a, a director of your company or uh, perhaps a company you worked at before. You know, his wife's behind the scenes, like a lot of people's mm -hmm. wives and, and partners. But in this particular you know example, as most of the unpaid labour is done by women. You know, that takes a lot of the pressure off when you've got someone, you know, running the family and running the household. Yeah, I mean, whether you're, whether, whether you're a man or a woman in a successful or a leadership role, you need a spouse or a partner who is going to support you. And, you know, I have worked for and worked alongside many men who I know that a part of the reason they were able to be so successful is because they did have a spouse behind the scenes supporting them. And I'm, I'm very fortunate because I have a husband who does that for me. Mm -hmm. He is 100% in support of my, um, I'm very career driven and um, it, it takes a partnership. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's, so my husband also works in a leadership role. So we're both in leadership roles. So how do you manage that is the question, you know, it doesn't. And the reality is for me, we can only do that because we have we have support. So we, we have an au pair. Um, if anyone wants to ask about au pairs, I'm, I love talking about au pairs <laughs> and how great that is and how that enables you to do lots of things in your life. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have to support each other. So I would say to all you guys, you know, think about that because the way that we think about it is it's, a, it's a, actually an investment for our future. We're both working full time. It takes pressure off of him as well. He's not the main breadwinner. We're, we're, we're pushing our, our future together. We're, we're investing for our future. So it might cost us a lot of money in childcare and, you know, all the, I might miss some school fairs, I might not make a bake a cake when I need to or whatever, but mm. you know, forget about that, it's not important. In, in the long run, you know, you're investing for our future and it's for the family's future as well, isn't it? You yeah. know, it's 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 so um I would say also to the women, you know, I know it might seem like half your salary is going on childcare or something, yeah. but it's not forever, it's a short term thing, you know, it's an investment for your future. Yeah. Mm. And and Holly, just on that note, I know we you know it's it's 2022. Some people might think that we're a lot far along than, than we were, and in, in many ways we are. But you know, you were saying previously about you know where you. I mean, you're British, but you are you do live yeah, in Germany. So I live in Germany, yeah. Um, but I am English, if you can tell yeah. by my accent. <laughs> and there is still that that kind of stigma, isn't there? So yeah, I mean, obviously it's a cultural thing. I live in the south of Germany, and to be honest, I'm an anomaly there. Yeah. My, my neighbors got a lovely family across the road. Um, the lady's always very curious, asking me where I'm going. She sees me packing my car up. <laughs> She's, you know, she says, says to me, where, where, are you, where are you going again? Oh yeah, I'm going on a business trip, okay. She's like, well, what happens to the children? And one of my, the things I've always said to people when they ask me that question is, where are your children? Or what, what do you do with your children when you're working? I say, oh, I just keep them in a cupboard. You know, because it's, it's such a stupid question, you know, obviously, if I'm working, my children are being taken care of, you know. Um, but so in the south of Germany or in Germany in general, it, it differs from from areas in Germany, East Germany. It's a little bit, little bit of a different mentality. But, you know, you're it's very unusual to be a full time, uh, full time working mother, mm. um, especially with small children. And it, you can be met with quite a negative from women and men, but more often women, actually, to be honest, mm. you can be met with quite a negative reaction. And, you know, even in Germany, there's a word for, for mothers that don't take care of their children. It's Rabenmutter, which is, in English, is raven mother. So basically, you're leaving, you're, you're fleeing the nest, so to say, you're leaving your kids, you know. I can tell you, my kids are quite fine. You know, they, <laughs> as long as I bring back a pack of gummy bears, they don't really, <laughs> don't really complain too much. So, you know, no one's kids are being harmed in the process of, of this, of this, yeah. of this uh, situation. So it's, you know, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's an yeah. interesting concept for me when I moved to Germany that, or interesting, I was quite shocked by the, uh, the, the, the mentality was very different to, compared to the UK. Um, so yeah, it really depends on also where you're living, doesn't it? You know, how mm. it's, uh, how, how it's perceived, you know, yeah. what's in place, childcare, you know, America has its challenges, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, absolutely. I mean, I live near Stuttgart, big, big, huge international companies there. You can't get a full time daycare for love and money. You know, it's, it's amazing for me, but yeah, it's amazing. Never heard that that yeah. term before. Yeah, really, really interesting. <laughs> um, 
I think one of the, you know, to, to, to bring it, I know we're kind of going through the challenges and advantages here, but I just want to, I think it's important to point out, and again, this is extremely well backed up by, by research and statistics, that having, you know, diversity in your leadership team is good for business. You know, it's, it's proven it's good for business. You know, it's um, just looking here, surveys show that when women in executive roles are, um, when women are in executive roles, it's associated with an increase in profitability. One study I was reading found an increase of 15%. So, you know, if, if that's not the way to kind of bring things home, I don't know what it is. And, and you know, there's, there's lots of st statistics out there. I know that we've, we were all talking about the, the book Lean In before, which is a, an interesting one. And, um, yeah, I think that, that kind of brought the, the point home for some of us, didn't it? I think you've, you've read it, haven't you, Amanda? You're a fan of the, fan of the book. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's probably one of my favourite books on, on the subject. Yeah. And it's um, Sheryl Sandberg, she's the CEO of Facebook. She's quite vocal about um, women in leadership. Mm. Um, she's got lots of stats and fantastic stories in there, isn't yeah. it, really? And, and, and her whole point, I think, of the book, there's two things, there's the sort of, let's talk about these issues, let's get things out in the open, because um, there are, I'm sure there's not, not a single man here that, that doesn't want more women in leadership. You know, it's, not, it, no, it's nobody's fault, it's just the way things are. And, and, yeah. and um, a lot of the time we sort of bring that upon ourselves as well, don't mm. we? Just, you know, the way that we've br been brought up, the generation that we're from. So we all need to be mindful of it, women included, and I think that's, that was her main point of it. Um, mm. You know, she, just as an example, one of my favourite examples that we talked about, she pointed out that this has come from an, a, a fact from an internal study at HP, actually, and she pointed out that women will only apply for a job if they can take 100% of the, um, the boxes, the criteria on that job description, whereas a man will, will go for a job if he can tick 60% of it, and they'll think, well, I will learn the, le the rest. Mm. It sounds interesting. I'm going to apply for it, but a woman won't. And, um, and I think that's a lesson for us all, isn't it? It's what we should, you know, be more confident and push ourselves more forward. And, and, uh, and you know, you guys, if you're interviewing a woman, you can go, well, I know that she can do 100% of the things on here. Because yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You cannot get the job, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. exactly. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it's interesting. So, Rosie, you know, like you were saying, a, a, a big, you know, female-led leadership team. Do you think that that how that impacts the business, how that impacts kind of the, the, the running of the business, the successes of the business? Yeah, we've got quite a diverse um, senior leadership team, which I think really does impact. And I, I tend to be, I don't know, not um, quite brash, and I'll just kind of just do what I want to do and don't worry about what's going behind me. But yeah. having other people um, alongside me, especially women, that are like, right, take a step back, look at it properly. Mm. Um, and then we've, so we've got very different voices on there. Definitely, mm. we've got um, nurturers. So, I, yeah, I am um, probably an anomaly in terms of I'm not your typical female um, personality type. But, yeah, having those people on the, on the team helps. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I think you need that, you know, like Amanda was saying about the five voices, just because one type is more likely to be what females tend to be more like, or male, you know, that doesn't mean that we can't be kind of switch between you know, your them, personality yeah. is your personality, your style is your style. Um, it's just about not having to emulate the, the traditional kind of male style of leadership as well. I think. Um, I just want to make sure that we cover the mentorship and company culture side of things. Um, I, I hope everyone had the opportunity to, to see Christy speak earlier today. If you didn't, it, you know, the sessions are recorded. Um, it, it really sounds like you're passionate about building a, a, a kind of mentoring culture, a, a coaching culture within the businesses that you work in. Um, does mentorship have, if you're mentoring women into uh, your business, does it have to be women necessarily that are mentoring them? What's your kind of attitude to how we mentor um, and coach kind of younger people coming into the industry or anybody coming into the industry? So I remember when I wanted to go into management and, you know, if you heard me talk this morning, I was told, no, that's not going to happen. And <clears throat> so I said, hey, there's this, there's this kid over here and he's in his early 20s and he wanted to go into outside sales. And I said, hey, how about I, I stop by and help this kid like once a week? I'll just stop in, take time out of my sales day, and I'll spend, you know, an hour or two hours. And 
ultimately, these weren't the words that were said, but the message I received was, well, we thought he would work with this, this guy in the sales department. And I said, are you assuming that I can't mentor this young man trying to get into outside sales because I'm a woman? Yeah. And, you know, it turns out, you know, he's still with the company. He is a salesperson. He's one of our best um, salespeople. And, uh, you know, I felt like I lead by example. Mm. And I think that's the biggest thing I would want to take away is, um, or for anybody to take away, is that it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. I, I mean, I've had wonderful managers throughout my career, all of them being men. Um, I'm very fortunate. I have a really good executive sponsor who is my manager and president of the company I work at. Um, and he's definitely helped me alongside with my coaching that I've had um, to help me develop. So I think it's important to have a diverse group of people at the table in organizations. It has to be balanced. And um, both men and women have to be at the table and part of the conversation. Mm. And then, you know, that coaching part is just really about asking questions and really listening. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. And I just, I, I want to bring Amanda in on this because, you know, having had the pleasure of, of talking to you quite a bit over the, the last few months and about Fast and the company you work at, you know, culture is really at the heart of, of, of what you guys are doing and, and um, you know, employee engagement, creating a, a great environment. Um, and I've, we've been up to, Marcus and I came up to see you. There's, you know, there's, there's women working in the business, you know, young women at the start of their career that are really kind of passionate and engaged. Um, and it's great to see. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how important that is and how you foster that kind of environment. Yeah, we do, we, we do spend quite a lot of time and effort on our employee engagement program. Um, I won't go into all the different things that, that we do, but... Um, we um, have a very clear vision and a mission that is, uh, it comes from the top down mm. and um, everybody understands what that, that vision and that mission is and it's communicated all the time, constantly, in a wide range of, of different ways. Um, and um, you know, one of the great things about that was that during COVID, we already had that in place and we could just carry on. And we didn't lose that engaged culture in, in the past couple of years, which has been, it's, you know, it, it, it was a fantastic initiative to start out and, mm. um, and, and deliver for us. Um, but it, it really helps when you're trying to attract younger generations, um, more females, just a, a, you know, a, a more diverse range of employees into the company. It helps to have an employee engagement program. It helps to have all these different ways that you communicate. It helps to have a purpose that you can then put out there to the mm. public so that people can see that. And you need to put that on your social media. You need to put that on your website. You need to put it in your job adverts. You need to make sure you put that across when you're conducting interviews. So, but you know, the, the younger generations, they're, they're very purpose driven. Mm. And um, the studies show, the data shows that women are more purpose driven yeah. than men. So if you mm. have that employee engagement program, if you work on your culture and you promote that publicly, yeah. you are more likely to attract a, a diverse range of applicants and, 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 you know, different employees, different voices, different opinions. Yeah. And I think that's, it's important to say, isn't it? Like you're saying, you know, younger people, women, they, they want different things. It's, um, we need to be concentrating on culture and making that a big factor of it. You know, this isn't the, it's not the 80s or the 90s anymore, and this is how we do business, you know, like it or lump it. People are going to be attracted to your business mm -hmm. because it's a good place to work, because they, mm -hmm. it shares people's values, you know? And that's how you reshape, or not reshape, but shape, or play a role in shaping the future of these industries, because... Um, you know, then as, as time goes on, perhaps not as quickly as, as we would like it to, um, I won't go down the quotas conversation that we've had before on this, on this after podcast so we don't have time, but it's probably not going as fast as we would want it to, but eventually we are going to have more balance, aren't we? Mm. We are going to have more balance um, in leadership and that will kind of be reflected down yeah. into um, other parts of the business and perhaps, you know, more in technical roles as well. Yeah, I think that's really sort of a critical point that the companies, you, you know, the, the people leading the companies, the, the, this needs to be policies there. That, you know, I've seen it at companies that I've worked for, sort of medium-sized classical German companies where, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, I, I was met with a negative reaction from, from other colleagues 
not, not necessarily direct colleagues, but sort of just people in the company, when I return to work after having my son. Mm. And, you know, that should, there should be a culture in place in, that, in, that, in a company where people would not even sort of dare even to, to ask you these questions like, oh, why are you back at work? Or, you know, so that, that companies have a lot to, to answer for in that respect. They mm. should create this culture in the company where, you know, they're, they're pushing everyone regardless and they're supporting all of their employees regardless if they're a mother, regardless if they're not, regardless if they've got elderly um, um, relatives they're taking care of, etc. Um, and so, you know, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be judged in in your company on on such things like that. And that that comes from a company culture, you know. Mm. That's yeah. It does, yeah. And we're all really busy. Companies are really busy. You yeah. get kind of bogged down in the in the day to day, don't you? That's why these kind of employee engagement things that are put in place, and um, you know, diversity and inclusion programs are put in place so that you know you are working towards something. And you know, we don't just stay doing things the, the way we've always done them. Mm. I think mentor, what do we think about mentoring? I know when we talked before, there's kind of a lack of, of formal mentoring w within companies. Does, does that need to, to change? I think it does need to change. I mean, I, you know, I work at a company that we've advanced and grown so much over the last couple of years. I think two or three years ago, we had 160 employees. Now mm. we have over 250. Mm. And we have to really start thinking about what are the formalized programs that we didn't need, you know, when we had mm -hmm. 160 people, but it needs to change and it has to be more formalized and consistent. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. The biggest thing is consistency. Yeah. Now we have multiple locations, multiple manufacturing locations. It's just a totally different need in order to mm -hmm. have that consistency. Mm -hmm. You need formalized programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. And, and, you know, to um, to go back to something that's that's really important is the education. You know, um, the education topic in the industry. I think I'm going to plug another podcast here. So cue all these up as you're you know waiting for your travel home. But um, the Thurston podcast we did about women in print. That's you know, we the had, best one. Yeah, yeah. It's, well, Definitely it's one of the best, best one. one of the best ones. I'm <laughs> the future print one. I'm equal. <laughs> um, you know, we were talking with with um, Jo Stevenson from from PhD in the in the UK. Um, she had better figures than I have, so please do listen to it because they do have the the figures there um, about education and about you know the the lack thereof. I think you know I think perhaps the US do do a little better in terms of the university programs. Um, Rosie, from from your perspective, apprentices you know tend to be male. You know, yes, yeah, always male. So we've we run apprenticeships constantly, but we always take on probably four or five every year um, in our print facility or finishing. Never once have we had a female mm. apprentice apply. So. Mm. A lot, like for me, I've grown up around the print industry and kind of worked my way up, but we're not getting those people who are coming in at the bottom to take up the leadership roles. So how do we expect there to be female leaders if they're not coming into the industry? Mm. Yeah, and it goes back to the whole STEM topic in general about yeah. you know women in in, in technology and engineering uh, mm. in science roles. I mean, in the print industry, generally you get female chemists. Yeah, um, quite a few, a lot. But other than that, it's from a technical perspective, you don't see so many engineers um, or application engineers. Um, it's also not so many. So it's kind of it's, that goes back to this this loop again about encouraging women, girls to consider other and, and also young people. I think I think in general, it's yeah. a problem for young people to get young people into the printing industry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in Germany, we still have the advantage. There are many. Um, print-based university degrees, or more so than the UK. I know in the UK, unfortunately, a lot of those have been been stopped now. Yeah. Um, or you know, there's a lot less of them. So there's, in general, there's more apprenticeship schemes in Germany. So you, it averages out a little bit more. I mean, I, I remember having we had at my uh, previous company, we had some women apprenticeships in sort of application technology, but it still, yeah, it still goes back to this. Yeah. Subject about you know encouraging women or and more mm. young people into our industry, which, as someone so nicely said earlier, is that that's a collective topic, isn't it, that we have to work on together? Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's to the benefit of everybody, isn't it, to to get 
young people, young women into, you know, not just print, but as you were saying, you know, STEM roles uh, mm. as well, just across the, the board. Um, anyone got any ideas on how we... <laughs> <laughs> have to we make print that? more sexy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean... I think you're right. I mean, I, how I, I, I... When I started my first position in the print industry, which was at Cer Cerakol, Fujifilm Cerakol, um, I had two, I knew I wanted to do a, do a dual studies, you know, where you're studying and working, and I had two options, because I lived in, if anyone knows, Broadstairs down in Kent, there's not so many options, had either Pfizer's, big pharmaceuticals, or, or Fuji, Seracol. And um, I got offered both positions, I was lucky, but for whatever reason, I was fascinated, because they showed me around the lab, and there was someone doing, you know, the old classic tape test, I was like, what are, they what are they doing with some sellotape there and everything? <laughs> and then it's in the lab, you know, there was a big, there's a Silverson, a big mixer, and there's ink everywhere, and, yeah. and I was like, oh, this, this, and but I was fascinated by these application mm. uh, tests, and uh, yeah, yeah, just really seeing it, you know, so maybe, maybe people have to do more open houses, career days, you know, for actually people to actually experience what that means, because if you tell someone you work in the print industry, they're like, ah, oh, okay, so do you, do you make those, those printers that I've got at home? You know, they've got no concept whatsoever. Mm. So I think maybe the company should do more sort of career days and, you know, bring your kids today, bring your kids to work days and things. You yeah. know, people have to see that it's a little bit more interesting than your desktop printer at home. Yeah. yeah. We at, at Farston, we um, we sort of we have two sides to our social media. We've got we've got LinkedIn and Twitter, which is very much about um, customers, partners, prospects. Mm. And then we also have Instagram and Facebook, right. and that is very much about the employee engagement side of things, trying yeah. to attract people to come and work for us, younger generations and mm. a more diverse mm. um, range of applicants. Yeah. And, and we post pictures of us having fun, the social stuff, just silly stuff, yeah. you know, when the dogs came into the offices, you know, just yeah. stuff like that to, to make it um, a more Googly or Apple type yeah. workplace um, in the minds of the people who are looking at Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. I think that's important, isn't it? You know, it's, you've got to go where they are, you know, they're, yeah. they're, on, they're on the TikTok aren't they, the kids today yeah, on the Instagram? Yeah, we've not gone that far yet. Yeah. Just, I need another few months uh, to I get know. my head around you that. Have to put a, in the job titles, you just need to put influencer. Oh, and yeah. And then I'm sure yeah. they're being, That's you know, yeah. they're being. True. Okay, well, my socks asked, were sounding really old. Well, I was just going to say, I asked a question this morning, how many, with a show of hands, I started out their career wanting to get into print and packaging. I, thought, I think I saw like a half a hand come up. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, what can we do as individuals running our companies or in leadership roles? What can we do to change that? You know, the social media buzz with around technology. There are these huge corporations that really drive that influence. You know, yeah. like Apple and yeah. Microsoft. These huge global companies, but in print, we just don't have that mm. um, because print is just tends to be so regionalized, mm. um, is, at least on the converting side. And we can't stop, we can't just keep waiting for some industry, you know, publication that's going to come out because it's just never going to have the volume of influence that we need. Mm. And then the US in terms of um, development, I mean, if you're going to college and you're going to go to school for packaging, I think there are two universities that focus on the structural design aspect. Mm. Or if you're going to art school, you might get into graphic design. But there's so many roles for all of the people here. We all have a diverse group of people and roles and technology that we sell. And it's just not getting the exposure. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, it it, it is sexy, I think, in many ways, <laughs> as a, an industry. And I think, you know, if give people what they want. If I, I came into the industry as a journalist and immediately, you know, got sent to, to Barcelona to see something on HP and then you're somewhere else and, you know, I thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, tell, tell young people they can travel, you know, show them, a, a, you know, the, the, the design and the refit on a, a football stadium and all the wide format print and everything. You know, I think show people what they want to see, young people. And, you know, we're talking again, like I said, it's not just women. It's about creating a, a diverse future for the industry. Um, and this is one for Dorinda as well, getting, getting the universities, getting the schools involved in, in, um, in showing young people, you know, the, the, the power of, of the industry that we're in. And I think we might be just about out of time. We've got the oh, two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Can I just say, I think you're, we're right about getting new people into the industry, but I think we also need to check ourselves when we're interviewing and all that sort of stuff, because unconscious bias is 
I'm like really passionate about this. You'll, mm. We are attracted to people who look like us, and if we all look the same at the top, then it, we will all look the same coming through. So you just have to check yourself with that. Yeah, I think that's that's important to say. It's again, that's we all have unconscious bias. Like I was saying, we all get kind of bogged down in the day to day. That's why you know training on those kind of things, educating ourselves on on those kind of things are, are really important as well. So um, and again on that. We did put together quite a bumper Google Doc of, of uh, great reading on um, diversity, on um, female leadership. Anyone that would like to um, get some more information on that research, uh, please do just, just let me know and I'll, I'll share it with everybody. But I would love to thank Holly and Christy and Amanda and Rosie and, um, and of course, to, to everyone at Futurebin for, for letting me put on this panel. Um, it's been so fantastic to, to speak to you and I'm hoping we can perhaps follow this up in some way, because it's a, been a really great conversation. So thank you to, to you four. Thank you. Thank you.